Okay, welcome everybody. Um, how many here have migraines? <laughs> how many have friends or family with migraines? Okay. It's estimated about 10 to 15 percent of the population has migraines, but this is probably an underestimation because most of you probably have different kinds of headaches, like one you label a sinus headache, one you label a tension headache, and one you label a migraine. But if they're recurrent, they're most likely all under the migraine family. So what is so mysterious about migraines? There's been a copious amount of research and there's a lot we do know about migraines, but we still don't know the sequence of events that occur in migraines. We don't know what causes them and why they happen. Migraines are a neurovascular phenomena. They involve neurons, electrical conduction, neurotransmitters like serotonin. They involve the vascular system in the brain and surrounding the brain. But migraines are more than that. They're more than just the central nervous system. They're really a, a truly a total body experience. And what, is, what are the elements of the perfect storm of a migraine? Two things, threshold and trigger that takes you, triggers that take you over the threshold. If you have a high threshold, you may never experience a migraine or rarely experience a migraine. But there are certain conditions that can lower your migraine thresholds, such as traumatic brain injury, major surgery, major car accidents or other types of accidents, chronic infections like untreated Lyme disease, toxic exposure, or, or sleep apnea, just to name a few. And what about triggers, of which there are many? Triggers are cumulative, and what's it's frustrating about triggers is that they can take a couple days to take effect. So for example, one day you have a glass of wine and there's no migraine. Another day you have a few sips of wine. Maybe you didn't sleep so well that night because you were stressed about work and the barometric pressure dropped as a storm moves in and boom, you are over that threshold. So migraines have been depicted in text and write and pictures, um, paintings and drawings for years. This is 1819 uh, demonic depiction of headaches by George Cruikshank. And I'm sure many of you can relate to poor George, right? <laughs> but migraines, the description of headaches go way back. In 7000 BC, relics showed something called trepanation, which is burring holes into the skull to relieve, to release uh, evil spirits. In 1200 BC, ancient uh, text in Egypt recorded painful headaches. In 400 BC, Hippocrates noted headache with visual disturbance, which we call an aura. In 1000 AC, one Islamic philosopher noted headaches worsening by eating, drinking, sounds, and light. And another noted headaches with, in pregnant women and menopausal women, we now call hormonal headaches. In second century, Ariadus of Cappadocia described unilateral headache associated with vomiting. This is the first true description of a migraine. In the Middle Ages, the treatment included hot irons and garlic implanted under the skull. In the 1930s, it was found that ergotamine, which is from fungus, it was used in women uh, in childbirth. They found that it constricted those painful dilated blood vessels that occur in migraine, and this was the first time it was really considered a vascular disease. So what are the parts of a migraine? What do we know about it? What's the path of physiology? We know that there's something called spreading cortical depression, that parts of the brain, there's decreased brain activity, and it spreads out to the cortex. We know that the hypothalamus is activated. The hypothalamus is the master gland of homeostasis. It, it controls blood pressure, pulse, thirst, hunger, temperature regulation, the fight and flight response, as well as the sex hormones. We know that the trigeminal nerve is stimulated. And we have a picture of the trigeminal nerve. It has three uh, branches, and this can be very painful around the eye, the cheek, and the jaw. We know that there's dilation of the meningeal vessels. So the meninges covers the brain, and the vessels dilate and are painful and inflamed. We also know that the microglia are activated. Anybody who's read Dr. Gary's book, Total Recovery, Dr. Gary Kaplan, 
Total Recovery knows about his research regarding microglia. Microglia are cells in the brain that are part of the immune system. And they eat up dead neurons, they eat up viruses and bacteria. But when upregulated, they actually produce an inflammatory cytokine. So here's a depiction of some of the things that go on with a migraine. We have activation of the brain stem, the hypothalamus in the middle of the brain, the trigeminal nerve with the three branches. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. Uh, the meninges that covers the brain, they, the vessels dilate and they're inflamed. And then we have the microglia, which are not pictured because they're microscopic. The International Headache Society has criteria for migraines. And this includes at least five headaches in your life, lasting greater than four hours, having at least two of the following, one-sided, pulsating, moderate to severe, aggravated by physical exertion, and accompanied by one of the following at least, nausea, vomiting, and photophobia, which is light sensitivity. But of course, not everybody fits into this criteria. So what are the stages of migraine? These are the stages of classical migraine. Now most migraines are what's called common migraines. They don't have the aura, but other than that, the stages are similar. We have the prodrome, which can last 48 hours, and this is characterized by fatigue, irritability, food cravings, maybe diarrhea, constipation. Then we have the aura phase, which is usually a visual disturbance that you may have numbness, tingling, vertigo, weakness. Sometimes this can even mimic a stroke that's lasting 20 minutes. So here's an example of a, a scintillating scotoma aura. But a aura can also be uh, just squiggles, lines, defects in the visual, in the, in the vision. Then we have the pain. We have the nerve impulse from the root of the brain stem to the meninges, releasing pain chemicals such as substance P, neurokinin A, calcitonin gene-related peptide. The microglia are releasing inflammatory cytokines, and this can last up to three days. This is followed by the postrome, which can be characterized by fatigue, weakness, maybe scalp sensitivity, and brain fog. Here again is our depiction, our picture. We have the brain stem stimulated, the hypothalamus, the trigeminal nerve, the meningeal vessels, and the microglia. What are some of the triggers? Sunlight, drop in barometric pressure with storms, so weather can be a trigger for many. Also odors, such as perfumes or, or cigarette smoke. Again, I mentioned sunlight. Erratic sleep, so with the invention of the light bulb, it's easy to have erratic sleep, right? So instead of going to bed with sun down and getting up with sun, sunrise, we can stay up really late. We also have our iPads and our iPhones and our computers on. This emits a blue light that interferes with melatonin. So erratic sleep is very common. Stress is a big trigger for migraines for most people. Hormonal fluctuations, mostly with women. And overuse of rescue medications. And this is a huge problem. So what happens with most people when, you ha when we have a migraine, we take a rescue medication. Most of the rescue medications have a vasoconstrictive component. So you, thought you feel relief after you take the rescue medication, but when it wears off, the blood vessels dilate with a vengeance. So what can happen if you're using these rescue medications too often, then you have this rebound phenomena, and it can go into a chronic daily headache, and this is very common. So we're going to tackle the overuse of rescue medications in a little bit. What about diet? or other beverages, food and, and beverages. So ca caffeine is a trigger. Chocolate, nuts can be a trigger as well. Aged cheese, meats that have nitrites and nitrates, wine, liquor, and fresh baked goods. And I'm, as far as I know, looking at enticing pictures do not cause a migraine, but you can let me know later on. <laughs> So caffeine is a big trigger for many. And by the way, a lot of the rescue medications have caffeine in them. Um, chocolate has phenylethylalanine and theobromine. MSG, monosodium glutamate, 
is a flavor enhancer, and we know we've heard of that in Chinese food, but it's also in marinades and sauces, and it's even in canned tuna. Aged cheese has tyramine. Meats that are smoked, fermented, tenderized have nitrates and nitrites. Yogurt, sour cream, and buttermilk are of trigger for many. Alcohol has acetaldehydes and congeners in red wine and dark liquors. Wine and beer have tyramine and sulfates, as do dark vinegars. Citrus fruits, bananas, raspberries, avocados have tyramine, as do onions and beans. So this is the typical food triggers for migraine. Not for all, but for many. Also, fresh, fresh baked goods, like donuts and, and bagels and fresh bread, pizza. Um, food additives, including uh, sugar substitutes like our aspartame, can be a trigger. And processed soy can be a trigger for many as well. So we're going to take a little detour and discuss elements of the diet that contribute to chronic inflammation and chronic illness. And then we'll circle around and relate it to migraine. We're also going to talk about a particular type of diet called a ketogenic diet. So these are some of the elements in your diet that, if in excess, can cause inflammation and chronic disease. Grains, sugars, and omega-6s. So before the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago, we were hunters and gatherers. With the discovery of processing grains, we were able to settle down, build communities, society, and culture. But there's always another side to the story. So grains, a diet heavy in grains, causes heart disease, cancer, autoimmune disease, and malnutrition. Grains are nutrient poor. They're 65% carbohydrates. They have no vitamin C, A, B12. There are still areas of the world that suffer from these diseases. One's called pellagra. It's a deficiency of niacin. It causes brain inflammation, digestive inflammation, and further malnutrition. This is found in areas of the world that's highly dependent on corn. In some areas of Asia, beriberi is found from a deficiency of thiamine. This is from a dependency, a high dependency on white rice. And this causes uh, encephalopathy, heart failure, and death. And what about wheat? We've heard a lot about wheat. So wheat has lectin, and it's sticky and attaches to the gut villi. The villi are little hair-like areas in the gut that increase the surface area of the digestive tract. They allow for allowing for absorption of nutrients, and the, the cells between in the gut are very tightly bound. But when there's inflammation, these these cells gap, there's gaps between the cells, and it allows toxins and large molecules to be absorbed. Phytates in wheat bind to calcium, zinc, and iron. The gluten, we've heard much about gluten sensitivity. These are gluten proteins that get, can get absorbed. They cause, excuse me, they cause further inflammation in the gut. And about a third of the population we do know that 6% of the population has gluten sensitivity, but it's really estimated that probably it's closer to 30%. 1% of the population has full celiac. This is a very profound inflammation of the digestive tract from gluten. And these uh, individuals suffer from a lot of autoimmune disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, type 1 diabetes. Um, they can have peripheral neuropathies and psychosis, just to name a few.